we're here to learn about neurodevelopmental disorders. And um, ADHD, to me, is one of the classic neurodevelopmental disorders because it appears in childhood. So I'm going to discuss kind of what are those symptoms of ADHD. I'll briefly go over the G, the gene, the genetic influence of ADHD, followed by um, kind of some of the descriptions of, of really other people's work, uh, excellent work, some of it done by Jay Gade and Javier Castellanos and, and many others, um, about what that ADHD brain kind of looks like flying at, say, shall we say, 20,000 feet, as it were, so more of an overview. Um, talk about some of the behavioral outcomes, what, you know, kind of what is the liability, if you will, of having ADHD in terms of some of the risk factors and whether or not we can predict some of these things. I'll touch on the treatment mainly because what I want to really actually start talking about is some of the enduring effects of treatment. And this is really, I think, some of the E that I want to get into because at some point, while we know that the stimulants that are used to treat ADHD and um, the neurogenergic agents can be very effective, I actually hope for something better and that we can actually alter the trajectory. So remember on the first day I said I study the trajectory, we screw it up, and then I want to fix it. So, you know, in an hour, this is a lot to cover, okay? So some of it's going to be a little bit brief as it goes. Um, we mentioned the RDOCs um, approach to studying these things, and I just kind of want to briefly go over it, mainly because I actually love this website. For any of the junior people in the room, it's really, the RDOCs really lays out all sorts of different kind of endophenotype characteristics, right, of what individual behaviors are important without being specific about diagnosis. And so as you start to look how some of these workshops that were convened by experts in the field, you start to see that different behaviors, as was discussed earlier, actually converge. So impulsivity is common to a number of disorders. It's common to ADHD, right? It's found in bipolar disorder, suicide, drug addiction, and everything else. So whatever we can learn about a single endophenotype actually can then have broader implications. And so I actually have very much um, come to grow to like the impulsivity construct, and we'll see that as that plays out. And then also that it emphasizes the approach that we shouldn't just be stuck at one level, that we really need to appreciate disorders across the whole continuum. And so I think it provides a good way to look at it. So the genes provide some sort of foundation. They can be differentially expressed across development. It's important to note that um, as part of this developmental profile, again, generally it's characterized by um, some sort of basic level. Things tend to build up between the childhood years and, the and during a peak somewhere during adolescence for a number of different markers. Um, and then it prunes as we become what we believe to be more efficient, as, as Jay's mentioned as well. But also within this whole process is the role of the environment. And that depending on what happens, different genes can be expressed or even perhaps the environment itself, just by having an effect, can and interact with the course of um, normal development as it was already going to progress on. Okay, so for today, we're going to talk more about the effects of stimulants, reprogramming some of that um, trajectory. So what is ADHD? Most of us think about the hyperactive child. Girls tend to be a little bit more of the inattentive type, which should remind me that there is actually a sex difference to this disorder. As Brad had mentioned, most of the um, early developmental disorders actually t seem to affect the boys more. Part of that could be because the boys tend to actually also overproduce more and show a different pattern of development. Is it, when people think about it, is it about the stimulants or as, if you're a parent or a family member or anyone who's had the opportunity to interact with these kids, it also, right, it isn't just affecting the child, but it affects the whole dynamic as well. In terms of the DSM-5 criterion that we use in the United States, the behavior must occur in two settings. In other words, it must be somewhat consistent. So school and home or work. Um, children are required to meet six of the criteria before it used to be seven. Um, adolescents are greater than 17 years and adults need to meet five. The stars have to refer to the fact that these are the new modifications that have been made. And several of the behaviors need to appear before age 12. And before, in order to really be characterized as having ADHD, it needed to be seven, okay? So what's happening is they're starting to recognize perhaps that there are more individuals out there that have been missed by the more stringent criterion. And so some of them have been loosened up a bit. Now classically, when we think about ADHD, we think about it as two core um, areas, one of an inattentive type, and the other is defined as more uh, impulsivity and hyperactivity. 
I just want you to glance at these. I'm going to go over them again in a minute. But these are, I said we need to meet six of these criteria. And this is often the inattentive type. These are the kinds of things that we look at. So has trouble holding on to attention, avoids or dislikes, reluctance to do tasks that require mental effort for a long time. So obviously, if you can't pay attention, anything that requires you to pay attention actually becomes very problematic. Forgetful in, in daily activities, easily distracted. Again, these are the other ones for the hyperactivity and impulsivity continuum. Fidgets or taps, talks excessively, has trouble waiting at a turn, easily distracted. So it's always the brightest, shiniest object in the room is what they're going to tend to orient towards rather than the teacher who's been talking you know, and paying attention or somebody like me. Right? Interrupts or intrudes, and so on. The hyperactivity, I thought for those of you that haven't necessarily seen this, this is actually a motion analysis system that was um, developed at McLean where I am with um, uh, my mentor, Marty Teicher. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like, these, it's an infrared, we track the motion of, of the kids, we put markers on the head, the shoulder, and the back, the elbow, and what you see is you see very little movement in a normal, in a typical child, but for an age-matched boy, for the most part, you can see these gross um, degrees of movement. The disorder also responds really well to stimulants, generally speaking, especially the hyperactivity component. Okay, and so this is just an example of how methylphenidate actually can work dose dependently to reduce those levels of hyperactivity. So to be honest, it's one of those disorders where a lot actually works. Okay, and so that's, that's probably the good news about it. Okay, now I like the dual, what I'm going to go over today and kind of start to use as some of my framework is the dual pathway hypothesis um, put forth by Sanuga Bark, but also developed by other people like BJ Casey and Joel Nig, and a bunch of other individuals as well. And so classically, when we've thought about ADHD, we think about this executive circuit. Okay, so if you notice, these are most of those inattentive symptoms that were there, but not all, because it also includes some of the fidgeting as well. Okay, and so characteristically, we have these inhibitory deficits that are characteristic of this, and more overall, this executive dysfunction that we think is very much involved, and that this constitutes ADHD. And for years, this has been pretty much the classic way that we've kind of conceptualized this disorder. On the other hand, what I like about this is this kind of has taken it out into a different realm, and we're starting to think about that there's a secondary aspect to it, where there's a reward deficit going on. Okay, and so there's changes in the reward circuitry that can be characterized by a shortened delay um, reward gradient. So for example, as I said, we're going to talk about impulsivity, and delayed discounting is one of those things where, if you will, you have problems waiting. Right? Waiting becomes a really big problem because if you do nothing, you can't get reinforced for it. So you behave impulsively in this case. The delayed discounting has to do with choosing smaller rewards sooner rather than waiting for something big. Right? So waiting for a paycheck at the end of the week is a very easy example in adults, but even just something as simple as I'll give you this, if you, know, if you can just wait 10 minutes, right? Just pay attention for 10 minutes, I'll give you a you know, dollar as opposed to I'll give you 10 cents right now. The kids will immediately go for the smaller reward. Okay? Um, avoid sustained attention and um, sustained attention tasks. Again, there's that waiting component that doesn't work very well. And the delay in aversion comes up, and you see um, individuals having problems, for example, sustaining in homework because what happens is it's a sustained attention task. So it's already painful if you can't pay attention and get your work done. And then it, be, it doesn't become very reinforcing if you put it off either, right? You turn it in, you have problems doing your homework, you turn it in, the grade comes back, it's not so good, and it becomes somewhat of a negative loop, okay? But I like this reward circuit as a way of conceptualizing it, and there is our daily B. Okay, so that gives you kind of a brief overview of what the disorder actually looks like. The G in ADHD is pretty well known. It's actually a highly heritable disorder. Okay, first degree relatives are four to five times more likely to have ADHD, and there's a tenfold risk of having ADHD if one of your siblings has it. So it's very clear that there's a line here. Um, some of the genes that are associated with, this is one of those horrible lists that people put up that no one expects you to read. But really, if you look, a lot of them are characterized by a dopaminergic component, the DAT1, for example. Um, expression of this gene actually results in decreased effectiveness of this, of the dopamine.
transporter, resulting in more dopamine being pumped out, okay? Or at least not being captured back in. Uh, changes in the dopamine 4 receptor has been associated with novelty, where seven or more repeats of the polymorphism actually makes individuals more novelty-seeking, um, and changes also drug response as well. Other ones include the noradrenergic um, transporter as well. So we have um, some catecholamine activity, but also serotonin seems to be involved because we know also that serotonin is also involved in impulsivity. And the other characteristics, nicotine for receptor glutamatergic, growth factors have also been linked. In other words, it kind of suggests that there's something going on with, shall we say, monoamine systems and perhaps their interactions with glutamatergic output as well and growth, okay? And so part of this might be the neurodevelopmental aspects of this disorder. Now, they also in interact with the environment cons pretty consistently. And in this slide from Joel Nigg is what you see is that there's this heritable component where we're not exactly sure what all those things are, but also that low birth weight, lead exposure, smoking is actually a rather large, um, other perinatal insults um, such as toxins and things like this also kind of can interact with the disorder as well. Things that we do know, for example, is expression, if you have the DAT1 polymorphism, that it interacts with alcohol exposure to increase the likelihood that you're gonna have ADHD. Similarly, it also interacts with prenatal smoking, so we know that this is a risk factor. Um, dopamine 4 receptor also interacts. Um, the serotonin polymorphism that we know interacts in terms of effect, uh, increasing expression of some of the effects of child abuse then also, results in ADHD-like symptoms where you actually see a significant amount of hyperactivity in some of these kids where this kind of confluence of things has happened. And, other, and it also interacts with psychosocial. So what does the brain look like? So not only do we have that dual pathway by Sanuga Bark coming up with the executive path and a reward path, but he actually also nicely laid out somewhat of a very overly simplistic circuit diagram. So. <laughs> You know, we're going to get to resting state just a little bit, right? So what I've kind of done is I'm, we're taking um, a simplistic approach, if you will, so that at least by the end that we can start to say things about what we do seem to know pretty well about the disorder. And that the executive path is actually characterized by more dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, as we know, and also includes the striatum. And so this is where that fidgeting comes in as well. The hyperactivity is associated with this pathway. Um, as opposed to actually associating it more with the reward pathway, which includes changes again in, in medial prefrontal or ventral medial um, prefrontal cortex, orbital anterior cingulate. The amygdala plays a role in here as well, and there's increased activity in this area. And the nucleus accumbens, of course, because as we kind of keep touching back on, increase in dopamine activity um, seems to be kind of that point for um, reward-based um, behaviors. So, if I had to come up with this simplistic slide to say what do we see in ADHD in general, a lot of these regions that are affected tend to be a smaller. There are functional changes, which we'll go over briefly. And there, there's some unique connectivity so that that highway between the, some of these brain regions seems to be preferentially strengthened. Again, this is part of a, more of a resting state kind of analysis that we've learned now. But also in these task-based MRI studies have we learned some of this um, that we can see some of these changes occurring. More overly simplistic diagrams. Prefrontal cortex, we can talk about a dorsal system where there's top-down guidance of attention and thought, um, affecting more of the sensory processes and basal ganglia. The inappropriate actions associated with some more of the frontal areas. But as we start to move more ventral, we bring in more of an affective and more reward um, kind of component to all of this, okay? And so there's regulation of the amygdala, the nucleus accumbens in this as well. Of course, it's more complex, so this is just to show you again, we know it's more complex, um, and that some of these areas also serve as dual, have dual duties in terms of modulating behaviors and whatnot. And also, just to highlight the role of the cerebellar nuclei as well. Um, in terms of their role in playing um, in, in some of the motor activities and other things as well. Okay, so if we start looking at what, what the morphometry has taught us, other aspects, there's, there is evidence for um, morphometric studies have shown us that there's a smaller dorsal and rostral anterior cingulate cortex. Um, this is one of the things I think they want to spend a minute on, 
right? So we have the pioneer of the field practically right in our midst, right? Jay Gee looking at, at these, these studies, um, looking at the trajectories of development, right? And so this is looking at caudate volumes uh, tracking across age, okay? So just measuring the morphometry and looking at it controls will actually undergo some degree of overproduction, if you will, of the, the size of this area that gradually shrinks with continued development. Individuals with ADHD tend to be a little bit smaller. Now, what's interesting here, and also kind of will be shown in another slide in a minute, is that it would appear that we get to the same point. I'm not so sure that's exactly it, right? If you take two different paths to get to the same place, did you take the same journey, right? And we'll, so I think we need to you know, consider that even though the pruning of these regions actually may get us to the same size, that you know, part of development is about making those connections between regions and synapses and what happens as we mature is we prune some of those off based on our experiences. If there's a delay in that process, the experiences that happen to you, you know, at 10 years of age are not the same experiences that happen at 15. And so you can already see potentially where you're gonna be wiring your brain a little bit different. Um, perhaps more important is the uh, development of cortical thickness um, that goes on. And so as you can see in the brains, um, in typically developing individuals, this is pretty much the pruning that goes on. Okay, so I, had to, I actually had to go back and look at the paper just to make sure I had it because the cortex thins, right? So we all know the classic, the classic J. Gee slide. See, I'm, <laughs> right, where we have this development changing in terms of gray matter, that it peaks differently, it peaks a little later in boys than in girls, um, but eventually it does actually prune again, right, that same trajectory. And so um, that that trajectory is different. So when you look at this slide, you go, oh, they're all building up. But what this actually is, is these are actually developmental curves. So at each age, point for point, it shows that the kids with ADHD are delayed in that process. So in other words, if they're building up, normal kids are building up, the kids with ADHD are still kind of back here a little bit. And so as you can see, there's this delayed development that happens in these kids as well. So again, just because they potentially end up at the same place doesn't mean it's the same process and the same result. Okay, fractional anisopatry differs um, between these ages, so looking again in this case, actually, the, the flow of water through myelin, that this changes, the corpus callosum is smaller, another J paper. <laughs> Functionally, we know that these, uh, there are changes. I wanted to show this because um, even though my, I, my ultimate goal is to spend more time on the reward pathway, um, I think it's important to recognize, though, that if you look at the, Stroop, the counting Stroop task, which I'll, I'll go into in a second, the activation patterns are now different where individuals with ADHD actually fail to activate, in this case, the dorsal anterior cingulate, okay? So if this is a functional MRI task. Um, one of the earlier ones, actually, to look at this process in, in individual adults with ADHD. So this is also a disorder that does persist. So it starts in development, maybe perhaps more noticeable in development, especially if the kids have hyperactivity. It's pretty hard to miss them if they're not medicated. Um, but it does, it does persist, and so what you have is some of these deficits. Now, for those of you that don't know the counting Stroop task, this is the regular Stroop task, right? So you can read these words, green, red, blue. I'm not going to embarrass myself as I go. Now, read them again, now that they're in different colors, right? You, you, <laughs> if you're all mumbling to yourself, you're going to find, see, I have at least a couple smiles out there. Somebody's had coffee this morning, right? You're going to find that it, it takes a little more attention and a little more, more you know, thought in terms of actually what you're reading. To, to read a word that says blue when it's actually colored red, your first instinct is actually almost to go with red, right? So the counting stroop is, you know, how many, how many times do you see the word dog? And the answer is easily three. Now how many times do you see the word? So that's the counting stroop, okay? And so that's pretty much what, I love the name, George Bush had tapped into. So, and it was good because that was out when he was president. So, um, <laughs> so these are uh, some of the other deficits that we see in terms of executive um, function deficits that you see. Left ventral prefrontal cortex is more active on tasks and controls than in individuals with ADHD. Same with dorsolateral, anterior cingulate, parietal lobe, 
is coming up again and again. Um, on the other hand, areas such as the insula cortex, middle frontal gyrus, um, thalamus, and, and um, paracentral lobe are actually more active in individuals with ADHD. So it isn't that there's this global loss of function, it's, it's kind of a rearrangement in terms of the activity. Now, emotionality, right? We talked about the reward circuit. Part of those circuits included in the amygdala nucleus accumbens. Emotionality on, on tasks where we measure prefrontal cortex activity is higher. And so this is ADHD, individuals with ADHD um, off of medication, on medication versus control. That if you actually have them do an emotion test, that they have more activation of the medial prefrontal cortex. On the other hand, if the valence of that emotion actually becomes more negative, they actually overactivate the other way, okay? And that there's, there's um, more of a deactivation that goes on in these individuals. So there's, <laughs> there's kind of no, no happy in between, if you will. And as you can see, like I said before, medication has been very effective at um, kind of helping to normalize some of these, these differences. Okay. So thinking, no, I have a couple of resting state slides. So Brad did an extremely elegant job explaining to us, right, resting state analyses and looking at some of those, those nodes of processing. This is a study by um, Damien Fair. Um, just looking at the, some of these nodes of processing, because I'm trying, I have an agenda today a little bit, right, with talking about medial prefrontal activity. Um, if you look at ADHD combined, so you can have, if you have a more severe form of ADHD, you'll actually have both of those subcomponents. You'll have the hyperactivity impulsivity component, but you also have the inattentive one as well, okay? So that's the ADHD combined phenotype versus just the inattentive alone, um, and then the comparison between the two. And that what you can start to see is that some of the prefrontal activity um, has a weaker control, if you will, in the ADHD combined group as well. Um, as shown by this black, the singular uh, opercular kind of network, which is right there. So it's this area controlling, again, right, associated with multiple kind of nodes in different parts of the brain. Um, there's cerebellar deficits as well that show up in this group. Um, now, if you look at resting state differences, so one of the things that you do when you actually want to look at resting state is you put in an area and you say, how is this area connected, if you will, functionally to others, right? This is really a measure of, of shared um, activity. And so, when, and that's called the seed. So when you actually seed the nucleus accumbens, these are the areas that start to show up. And so controls, you have all these different areas associated with nucleus accumbens activity, so a lot of frontal cortex activity. Um, again, different motor regions as well. Um, in ADHD, you see some differences. When you subtract them out, what we end up seeing is that the relationship between the accumbens, again, and, and the prefrontal is greater than in the controls. And that's, where are we? It's, Right, so that's actually shown down here where ADHD individuals are, have more activity than the controls as opposed to anything that's kind of in the oranges where the controls actually have greater activity, resting state connectivity. Let me back, be back up um, compared to um, the ADHD individuals. And so there seems to be this strong relationship between these two regions, the frontal cortex, ventral medial cortex, and the accumbens. And the reason I'm, I'm Emphasizing this is eventually we're going to talk about substance use. So the next thing he did is look at this impulsivity construct. Okay, So delay discounting, again, where you want something, you're happy with something smaller sooner, you can't wait, as opposed to waiting for a larger reward a little bit later, um, actually correlates really nicely okay, with activity then in um, the superior frontal gyrus. And so again, these seed regions is what we see, is this is looking at this connectivity between these regions as it relates to um, the degree of discounting, or in this case, impulsivity. And so this is increasing levels of impulsivity, and as the connectivity increases on the x-axis here, you can see that in both the left um, anterior prefrontal cortex that you get greater act, there's this strong relationship with more connectivity between those two regions, the more impulsive you are. 
Now, if you think about it, at first blush, you would say, why would that be? If the prefrontal cortex is supposed to be this top-down suppression of activity, then wouldn't more activity be better? And as I will show you, actually, in my second talk, it isn't exactly that simple, OK? It kind of depends on what kind of activity and what's driving that activity that leads to that level of impulsivity. Not, it isn't just a global, you know, putting a big blanket on activity at all. Um, and so that's part of why this fascinates me so much. Okay, so there seems to be this kind of superhighway connection. And lastly, again, I, this is, trust me, this is just a very superficial, <laughs> in many ways, just smattering of a number of very excellent MRI studies that are out there, or imaging studies, because this is a PET study, um, looking at ADHD and the underlying neurobiology. But as, again, individuals with ADHD have a much higher propensity for substance use disorders. And one of the things that we know about substance use disorder is that there's a decrease in D2, D3 receptors in the ventral striatum or accumbens. And so Nora Volkow, who's the, our head of, of the National Institute of Drug Abuse, has just been a leader in this field for years, and has shown is that um, these D2 receptors are actually lower in these ventral striatal regions in individuals with ADHD. So what are we building towards? We have increased connectivity between medial, prefrontal, and ventral striatum. We have another risk factor in terms of decreased D2 receptors showing up in these individuals as well that seems to be um, pretty prevalent and whatnot. We know that to some extent, right, that there are a number of genes, candidate genes, that have been identified. Um, the environmental influence, though, is also important, okay? And part of this, you know, I have, I'm not really going to talk about the role of behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy with some of these kids. We know that that works, too. It just generally seems that stimulants seem to be very effective in this group. And as Brad mentioned, behavioral therapy is expensive. It's time consuming. Um, is, you know, so while it does work, it is a bit more of an effort to use it. So, um, but E in this case could be a number of other things as well. ADHD is associated with a delay in maturation, actually in a number of regions, not just the prefrontal cortex, but that there is something different, very unique, and well characterized about the prefrontal cortex relationship in that reward circuit that might be very important for ADHD. And also that, um, for the point of, again, building my agenda, ADHD is associated with altered function, okay? And generally, um, there's been studies, Monique Gerns has done a PET study looking in girls with, uh, actually women with ADHD, that glucose utilization is lower, dopa decarboxylase in the, in the PET study is lower, that we know that there is a deficiency of dopamine, despite the fact that we're talking about a disorder of hyperactivity, you'd think that there'd be more, okay? We know that there's also less dopamine in prefrontal cortex, okay? So um, as we move to the next phase then, Clearly, the hyperactivity is just very prevalent. But as I said, I'm going to try to focus more on the reward circuit. And as, as Sanuga Bark conveniently did for me, he put it in the other side. Um, and there is a dissociation in terms of what I'll show you in a second talk in terms of mechanistic um, um, underpinnings of some of these behaviors as well. That actually does make that a very reasonable classification. Um, novelty seeking is high and drug use. And the role of early onset is, is extremely important because there's been a number of epidemiology studies showing that the earlier you start using substances, the more likely you are to become addicted, okay? And so the fact that this is a population that starts early actually um, is, is a bit disconcerting. And so what kind of, you know, why, why treat? Impulsivity is a problem, but it goes beyond that. ADHD behaviors, the inattentive, the impulsivity, and everything else results in a number of just not inconveniences, shall we say, for child and family, but more importantly, driving infractions in the sense that, so the numbers are going to be ADHD versus a typical control, <coughs> age match control, okay? 49% versus 20% for the number of driving infractions, accidents, things like that. Of course, these lead and other things lead to more emergency room visits, head injury, so you, <laughs> Talk about adding insult to injury, if you will, no pun intended, <laughs> right? But that, it, in essence, triples in terms of head injury as well. Drug use, again, we'll talk about later. 
Other risk behavior that may not be so obvious, but might be, in, as we'll talk later, is risky behaviors also go into other domains, such as sexual activity, unprotective sex, that moment where you just don't think because it's you know not just the heat of the moment, but you're also really impulsive. So the fact that you're actually going to take care of that actually has some pretty untoward consequences in terms of, of looking at un just unwanted pregnancies, sexually transmitted diseases. Um, so it's something to consider. And then, I hate to say it, there actually are more potentially more kids eventually, more kids, more teens and adults that ultimately have the ultimate consequence of high-risk behavior. Um, here's what the drug use looks like. This is based on what I, you always hear referred to as the gold standard study for ADHD that's been conducted in the United States, the multimodal treatment study that, well, I have a slide later, but actually was designed to look at the effectiveness of various forms of treatment. So there were sites set up all over that collected all this data. But here I have the slide because it looks at substance use disorder in individuals at various stages of the design. So the kids are still pretty young at this stage. Mean ages are 10 and 11, right? So this is the study after 24 months into the study of collecting this data. What did drug use actually look at? So this is looking at polysubstance use, one substance, two substances, this is light green, three substance, four substance. And the groups are ADHD, uh, versus typical, um, a very typically developing control group, okay? And like I said, not only is substance use higher, it's already starting to increase at a much younger age. Why is this important? Because the idea is potentially, yeah, and I'm hoping I'll have enough time to get to it in the second talk, is that as the brain is building up, that changing that trajectory, as the brain is building up, the number of markers that are being expressed there actually can potentially get locked in and cause that enduring vulnerability because it's using the information that's going on in the external milieu to, to wire up, right? Environment has a significant influence, not just the things that happen around you, but also what's going on here. And so if you're ex repeatedly exposed, exposing to increasing levels of dopamine, you actually may be wiring those underlying molecules that are responsible for increasing the addiction. Likewise, you know, that's the glass is, is half empty, the glass half full side of that, is, is potentially you can actually decrease that process as well, okay? And so a lot of it has to do with the timing of the intervention as well. But what you see though is you have more polysubstance use going on in this ages that then continues eight years out. Okay, so substance use is very much of a significant problem in this age. Um, so lately, and we'll, again, we'll talk about it more, is there's been a wrinkle to some of this. It isn't just pure ADHD that actually drives a lot of these enduring concerns. It actually seems to be conduct disorder. So ADHD, like Tourette's, is one of those disorders that has lots and lots of comorbidities, of which conduct disorder is one of them. And that if you actually go back and look at some of these kids in terms of with statistical analyses, this study um, here is actually I think I have the stats on this slide. It's on the next slide. Is a Swedish-based epidemiology study that went into the records of tens of thousands of individuals and said, what are your trajectories, okay, for looking at, at um, development? And when they actually started to look at how much ADHD itself predicted the risky behaviors of either driving or risky sex, the effects are really modest at 0.22 or 0.1, even less than you'd expect. When they took the diagnosis, the comorbidity of, com of conduct disorder, antisocial personality disorder, it's kind of one of those consequences if you kind of continue to develop along a negative line, um, those two are highly associated with each other. What you see is that those relationships now become significant. So now 0.57% of the variance, or 57% of the variance is accounted for, 61%. Um, and likewise, okay, so that there seems to be that conduct disorder may actually be more of a differentiating factor for a lot of these risk behaviors than I think we, we earlier thought. Okay, so this is kind of where the field is going a little bit. But if we go on, jail also is another one. If you have risky behaviors, you don't think. Incarceration is a real problem. Treatment seems to help a little bit. Um, these are Kaplan-Meier uh, survival curves in terms of looking at what happens. This is 
I guess this is the glass is half full, right? Patients without a conviction. <laughs> um, but as you can see, if you have ADHD and you're untreated, you're more likely to go to jail, okay, than if you are actually treated. And the same with actually women as well. So again, it's a large, large um, epidemiology study. There are a number of caveats to this, and yet at the same time, it actually allows us to make some of these statements as well. So I think one of the biggest concerns with this study is it was actually more of a self-report by the parents if an individual had ADHD or not. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those diagnoses that you probably are pretty certain about. Okay, so the psychopharmacology of treatment. I'm not going to go over it that much. In fact, this is really simple. <laughs> okay, the stimulants for the most part, there are variations on the theme. Pretty much in general, they increase dopamine levels, norepinephrine levels. Um, methylphenidate does both by blocking the transporter. Um, there are various, and this is even, the list is longer for all the clinical names of the meds that are out there. There's Ritalin, it can come in a short-acting form, a long-acting form. In the United States, you can't just send the kids to school with their meds, they have to go see the nurse. Well, if they have to go see the nurse, that's potentially stigmatizing. And if you think about it, what you have is you have the dr drugs are effective for a while, they have a relatively short half-life, they wear off right before lunch, and you know, Johnny still has another couple hours left of school. So between stigma concerns is part of it, of having to go to the nurse to get your meds, and just the fact that you really want your child covered for the whole day, efforts were made, right, to develop a long-acting um, form of Ritalin as well, of which there's multiple variations out there as well. Amphetamine, amphetamines, no, um, Adderall is, is one of the more common ones that's out there. There's a new one, I'm gonna get it wrong. At Latuda, that's it's actually a prodrug of amphetamine that, as it gets metabolized, it slowly releases into the system. <laughs> um, Atomoxetine or Stratera is also relatively new within the last decade. Stimulants have been around a very long time. Um, this is supposed to be the more norepinephrine selective agent, and why is that so important? Well, because cocaine and methylphenidate actually are extremely alike. And so I've just shown you all these slides of kids that are more likely to use drugs, and here we are giving them a cocaine-like drug. There are some important differences too, but nonetheless, we do know that Ritalin is, is, very, is abusable. You have to crush it up and you have to work for it a little bit more but, um, than, than just um, using cocaine, but it still will give you a high if you do things the right way, if you will. So there was a drive to actually come up with a non-addicted stimulant if you will, um, that works, and atomoxetine was one of the first answers. Okay, so what it does is it blocks an noradrenergic um, uptake carrier, resulting in more levels of norepinephrine in the synapse. Um, but because what you want, though, is also you want to increase the levels of dopamine as well in prefrontal cortex. So that seems strange because there isn't a lot of dopamine transporters in the prefrontal cortex. So if you're selectively targeting those agents, how is that really going to work for you? And the, uh, the thought is, is that it's very promiscuous in that sense, in that the norepinephrine transporter, when it's blocked by tamoxetine, actually also helps to dump out dopamine in the prefrontal cortex to kind of help compensate. But it doesn't necessarily have that kind of action in the subcortical structures like the nucleus accumbens where more dopamine would, would lead to that addictive potential. So by virtue of distribution of the transporters themselves and promiscuity or not, as it's found in the addiction-related areas of the accumbens, this actually is, effect, it doesn't really necessarily increase levels of addiction, isn't, isn't abusable. So in that perspective, it's safer, if you will, than sending a child to school with Ritalin that then has been diverted to other, other um, reasons. On the other hand, um, there are concerns with using this drug at all. Last I heard, it's not, it is not a first line um, drug that's used, it tends to be more third line because there are um, cardiac issues and other subtle things that come up as well that we don't see with the other drugs. Okay, so I think I belabored that enough. Um, Amy Ernston has uh, nicely built a career in terms of looking at how information is processed in the prefrontal cortex and what exactly happens. Um, norepinephrine actually plays a very significant role in attention and executive signals. And so the idea is, is that 
norepinephrine itself will increase important information coming in that you do want to pay attention to, right? It's part of that arousal system that's conducive for life, and so if that information comes in, you want to pay attention. So for kids that have an inattentive subtype, that's what you want to do. Dopamine, on the other hand, she describes as noise. Well, it's the noise that sets your context, if you will, right? It's released, you know, Wolfram Schultz has shown us that it's released in terms of novelty, right? We get increases in, in dopamine that says, hey, this is really cool. I haven't been here before, right? So it's not noise, it's just other information. But in terms of focusing down on the, on the moment, it may, may, you know, considering it noise might not be a bad way to go. But nonetheless, there's a balance between these two systems that when they converge onto a pyramidal cell dendrite, ultimately will control the information flow that then goes on to those subcortical systems where the actions are going to take place, or the other cortical systems. Um, so Erica was talking about our shared slides. <laughs> Um, the oversimplification, which actually um, is, is somewhat true, is looking at these connectivities that go on between prefrontal cortex and striatum and how they change across age is really important. Like I said, we're back to the trajectory. Physically, we've done track tracing studies in our lab in rats alone. We know that this is actually a linear process. Functionally, it, it is not. Okay, and so while they physically they're going to talk to each other more and more because the superhighway is built, um, what we're concerned about though is how does that actually work? So if the prefrontal now is your executive top down control system, uh, BJ Casey proposes that it, it develops in somewhat of a linear process. Okay, in the background to all of that is the development of the reward system striatum, ventral striatum, accumbens, call it what you will. And that the reward, the reward processing actually kind of bubbles on top of that. It's nonlinear. And to be honest, I'm trying to think. All right, it's coming up. What we see is this is um, recent work done in my lab um, by Jessica Stannis, who is actually presenting is it next week for the FENS Forum. Um, and so here is actually the develop of those ADRA2 um, norepinephrine receptors that we know that the drugs that are used to treat ADHD work on. And sure enough, they develop in a very linear way. What's important about this study is that we actually trace those pathways. So if you actually look at these neurons that project to, from prefrontal cortex that project onto the striatum, or in this case, the nucleus accumbens, and for the uperus, the core, the nucleus accumbens core, which we know is involved in reward processing, it's actually a linear development, okay? that progressively there is increased ADRA2, and shall we say, receptor expression on um, those projections. So this is actually what we're finding. Conversely, we've known ba on, based on other studies that were done in my lab in 2008, you look at those same tra traced cells and you look at D1 receptors, which are actually important for salience, encoding salience, you get an inverted U. So they overproduce, they're low, they're high, and they come back down again. And we're going to talk, my whole next talk in the, in the next um, segment is going to be talking about these D1 receptors. Okay? And so what you have on top of progressively linear development in terms of modulation and control is enhanced reward. And the net result actually results in risky behaviors, if you will, if you have one driving the other. Okay? And so that's really what we're trying to show here is that as D1 is overexpressed, that the relative balance, it's not even a, <laughs> if, you, if you were to go back and look at the cell counts, there are very, very few of these D1 receptors, but they seem to be potent enough to drive the, the behavior. And maybe, to be honest, maybe it isn't exactly the D1 that right now happens to be a fantastic marker for us. Um, and as we have overexpressed them, um, we actually get changes in behavior. So looking at the adult system, this is delayed discounting. So this is looking at impulsivity now, and how can we drive impulsivity based on just manipulating those dopamine receptors in the prefrontal cortex. Again, this is on Jess's poster. Um, <laughs> like a good mentor, this paper will be out in about a month when I get back. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, right, if we use a virus, so we've developed lentiviral vectors, that are specific for glutamatergic cells. So we know that if we inject them in prefrontal cortex, that we're selectively hitting 
glutamatergic cells. Now, admittedly, we're hitting projections to that go all over the brain. And that might be apparent in some of the other behaviors that um, this receptor can drive when we put that virus in. But for at least the track tracing and things like this that we know, it's just too good that there's this natural relationship. If we overexpress D1, we can actually increase the level of impulsivity in adults. We, should, we see more delayed discounting um, than, we would at, um, than we would normally at a lower point. If, on the other hand, we increase the alpha-2 receptors, in juvenile animals that are already somewhat, the control is um, delayed discounting. The behavior alters a little bit with the control virus, just to note that. But normally what we see is we see developmental curve where we have juveniles are very impulsive at the earliest delay points, because we know kids are more impulsive. There'd be something wrong if I said, no, it's only adolescence. It's not. What we see is a temporal kind of condition. So the juveniles are very, are significantly impulsive at the immediate time point. So you see it right away, right? If you put a candy bar on a, on a table and tell a five-year-old who's starving not to touch it, how long do you think he's going to last, right? So we know that kids are more impulsive. And we, we've been able to actually model that in the rats. But it's usually more at short intervals. And then it doesn't necessarily change across time, delay time, right? It's kind of like they're impulsive and it just hits that point. Adolescents, they can modulate it for a little while, and then they got to go. So they have a little bit more of a delay, and so it's fair to say that they're both impulsive kind of in their own way. If we use this as the mix, though, when we actually now overexpress those ADRA2 receptors on those same pyramidal neurons or within the prelimbic, um, prefrontal cortex, what we actually see is we actually see a reduction, actually in dependent, uh, delay dependently, in terms of the impulsive behavior, okay? So that the number of small re rewards relative to, to controls actually goes down. So that, at the other hand, would suggest that increasing under 2 a receptors is actually maybe more effective in decreasing the impulsivity early in life. So this is, this is actually all new to me, too. Um, <laughs> all right, so now let's get to the last part. Oh, that's a bad for the timing. This is one of my favorite topics, and it's changing. <laughs> it's fair to say that. It's the classic Jay Gates slide, the one that we see everywhere. But I love it because it has a trajectory on it. So frontal gray matter increases. These are boys. These are girls. Girls develop earlier. And you know, I was, I was whispering in the back before you were saying, right, you don't know why girls and boys are different in terms of the trajectory? I do. It's very simple. See, boys overproduce more. You can see it more in other measures. And, and it, you know, other measures that I've done include dopamine receptors, where boys are really way up and down, and girls are kind of like, eh. OK? But it's, it's just simple, Jay. Girls get it right the first time. <laughs> we don't need all that fine tuning, all that modulation. It's just, it's just how it is. So all right, but all jokes aside, because this system is so much in flux, OK? The question is, is this really a period of vulnerability? We know, right, one of my other areas is child abuse. We know things that happen in childhood can have lifelong devastating impacts, right, on, on development that aren't necessarily as game-changing, shall we say, if they happen later in life, OK? So the question is, is, is this a period of vulnerability? Or I like the window of opportunity. So we're back to the glasses half full. So this brings up the whole issue. <laughs> The psychologists are laughing. I like that. Do you know who this is? Anyone? Conrad. It is Conrad Lorenz, right? So this is the whole classic thing of imprinting, right? Where you know he had ducklings hatch, and he was mom, and they followed him around everywhere. Um, but it's because there's points in your in in your life where certain information, in this case, following your mother if you're a duckling, um, actually is going to have maximally sensitive. Your brain is maximally sensitive to that. It's different than a critical period, but I don't want to belabor this too much. Critical periods is you need the information to develop, as opposed, absolutely, presence or absence. Information into the eye, if it doesn't develop, we know that those cells change and you can, right, you can get shifts in, in lateral dominance in terms of, of um, visual experience and, and innervation. But, Sensitive periods are different because it's an opportunity, shall we say, to change. It's like teaching your child sports, right, when they're developing. There's a period where it's easy, teaching them music, teaching them languages. It doesn't mean you can't learn, it's just harder, right? So there's reasons why certain things should happen. But we know that 
in terms of what you're teaching, it differs across brain regions, so different skills may be more linked to certain brain areas than others. That's one of the first things to kind of keep in mind. Mechanism, same thing. Sex, there are sex differences in this process as well. Um, Usually it's a whole separate lecture for me, so I'm not going to belabor that too much. But know that information that goes into building that better brain, okay, has a lot to do with sensitive periods for that, that finishing school, as I kind of like to call it. So the whole thing I'm interested in, trajectory, screwing it up, which would be ADHD, right, where we have these known deficits, um, is whether or not we can, we can fix it, okay? So... In, in the early 2000s, right, um, we knew, if you will, that substance use is a, is a problem in individuals with ADHD. They were, they were word seeking. This always becomes this question of whether or not they're actually using substances to self-medicate, right? Because if stimulants make them feel more normal, more typical, then you would be more likely to go out and use it. So there's always this question, and I'm not sure if I, I spent too much time on it, um, we've actually been able to replicate some of this in animals, so um, in normal animals, so there isn't, it isn't necessarily a self-medication thing. And so not only do they use more substances, more likely to use substances, they actually start earlier, which again, for programming that trajectory for substance use, loosely speaking, um, actually becomes a problem. And so again, early, early on, Salmonism and Rochelle Klein in New York and others associated with them looked at lifetime rates of substance use, okay, in their population. And this was a prospective sample, which is hard to get, but um, Rochelle Klein has been following these individuals since the late 1960s, right, if I understand this correctly. And so what they were seeing is that individuals who are actually treated with methylphenidate, so treating a potentially drug addictive, you know, a, a population that's potentially really addict, likely to become addicted to stimulants with a stimulant, right, actually matters on when you treat. So if you treat early, you actually get no, no change in substance use. So that curve kind of collapses down, if you will. At least this is the thinking, okay? If you treat later, the later you wait to intervene, if you will, that risk actually just kind of still kind of continues, okay? So the earlier you get in and intervene, and I would argue perhaps during a sensitive period, you actually might have a chance at redirecting that trajectory to go on to use substances. So I, I don't know if I'd call, okay, so I showed you the curve that said that the, um, the, Cox, the, the Cox proportional hazards curve that shows, right, earlier likelihood of using stimulants. But so, Lately, we've been rethinking this. I showed you the earlier slide that said ADHD predis predicting risky behaviors actually may be more mediated through conduct disorder, which is what's actually starting to show up here. And so when Joe Biederman, the original sample I just showed you, went back and controlled for conduct disorder, what did he say? Failure, failure function adjusted for lifetime conduct disorder. That same curve of substance use changed. They collapse back on top of each other. Okay, so if you take conduct disorder into account, there isn't necessarily, you know, kind of a beneficial protective effect of stimulant use. And so what does that say? Glass half full says, if we medicate the kids with ADHD with conduct disorder as a comorbidity, we can actually decrease the risk for, like, for risky behaviors. Okay, so it isn't, a, it isn't a complete wash. Okay, so this is in light of, like I said, earlier the answer was yes, now we start taking conduct disorder into consideration, and it changes, okay? Um, this is back to the multimodal treatment study. Again, like I said, we talked about the drug use being higher. Just to give you an idea then what that looks like on a much larger scale sample. Now, these are the kids that were treated with, that had, had substance, are likely to start using substances and as we start looking at whether or not maybe there's a difference in terms of what kind of classes of substance they use, this is the, shall we say, the enduring benefit of treatment, okay, and how much they're using. So this is percent using substances, 20%, 30%, 40 on and on. I like the great white space that was left for me so I could label it clearly. Um, <laughs> those of you making slides would understand that. Um, right, so 23% versus 16% relative to normal controls, okay. This is looking out over enduring effects of, early, of earlier treatment, 
In other words, there is not, right, th these kids are not necessarily doing much, much better, as it were. Anatomically, there hasn't been a lot showing that there's huge benefit. Ooh, I have three minutes to get through the rest. Okay. <laughs> um, there's some changes subtly in terms of white matter where treatment actually seems to help normalize, right? A medicated adjustment group versus controlled versus an ADHD group. So there seems to be some subtle increase, but it hasn't been astounding. This is compared to the animal literature where juvenile treatment in animals actually increases tyrosine hydroxylase immunoreactive. So these are controls, these are methylphenidate treated. Um, decreases the net, which is interesting. These are just missile stain cells. And that what you see is you see significant differences when lo you look at them during adolescence, but then as they continue to develop, those differences start to go away, which may not be a bad thing, right? They're kind of pruning into their own, right? And be, still becoming kind of normal. We used fMRI years ago, right? So this is looking at um, juvenile exposure to methylphenidate on, on regional cerebral blood volume. What I like about this slide is it shows you, right, some of the blood patterns. This, this is why I showed you the George Bush slide, right, because, right, there was the absence of, of activation patterns. Now we're showing that if we've treated the animals with um, methylphenidate, granted this is a methylphenidate challenge in these animals, but nonetheless we can still use it as a probe for, for activity. Um, we actually don't see a significant difference of methylphenidate treatment that lasts, okay? So we treated early, tested later in that executive circuit. Where we see it is in the medial prefrontal, the cingulate, the thalamus, and not the striatum again. So talk about the dual, dual pathway model, right? We're getting enduring effectiveness uh, changes, increasing blood flow to regions that may be actually um, a little less functional in the reward side, but not necessarily selective enduring effect in the executive side. Just to show you some of the other behavioral things. This is the reason why I still kind of, I don't think I'm stubbornly hanging on to this. I think it's a matter of choosing wisely. Is if there is an increased risk of substance use that may go down with treatment, if we use place conditioning, and again, I have normal animals, okay? So my baseline starting point is different. But if we look at um, place conditioning, so I always describe this as voting with your feet. We ask the animals to, we, we expose them to a chamber, no difference between the two sides of the chamber, okay, they're free to move, so baselines are normal, and we condition them to the context of one side where they're sailing, the other side where there's cocaine. We do it for just two days, it's, it's, it's actually really pretty powerful in our hands. And then we ask them on the fourth day, how, you know, kind of the essence is, is how do you like it? And so they vote with their feet, right? Which, where, which context do they want to spend more time in? Do they like the cocaine side? Or if they didn't like it, then they're going to go to the other side. So in essence, that's what this is showing, is that animals exposed as juveniles, right, during that developmental window, that sensitive period, actually don't like cocaine as much. And that others have replicated this as well. If we expose during adulthood, there's really no difference. The interesting thing about this, and I don't know if this may have impact on the MTA study and some of the other things, I don't think so, is it actually increases with maturity. So P40 is, uh, postnatally 40 for a rat is kind of a early adolescent, mid-adolescent point. And what you see is, let's go back, is you don't really see a place preference one way or the other. As the animal continues to mature, things are starting to prune down. Yep. Oh, yeah, I, I got, I'm almost done. I am. Um, what we see is, is that, that difference actually starts to, to increase. So the dual pathway, I've shown you executive circuits, which we'll go back on, right, that there's catecholamines in neurobiology and anatomy. There's the psychological processes, right, these different behaviors that go along with it that go to ADHD. Associated with them are different anatomical circuits for an executive and reward. Methylphenidate at first blush may actually seem to selectively program or reprogram some of the reward pathway or not. Um, as I'm going to talk about in the next section, the, um, I'm really interested in this delay aversion, the delay discounting aspect as a really good marker of impulsivity. One of the reasons is, is it's actually really pretty much a convenient quick test you could do with kids and you can do the same kind of thing with the rats. So it, it gives me a good translational point. And that about, according to, this is a paper by Mary Salanto, about 26% fall into that category. So 
executive disorder. The G we know influences monoamine growth. The brain, a delayed trajectory. Still seems to get there structurally, but path, once you get there, it's a little different. I think that the high risk behaviors are going to be the most concerning. We know that the stimulants that target dopamine and norepinephrine, at least in terms of the reward, actually work well. Um, I think when they've tried serotonergic agents, I don't think they've been as effective. But some of these other drugs do have, like the amphetamines actually do affect serotonin as well. And that might be part of why there is a differential selectivity for those agents. Um, imprinting. I, I still believe that we can reduce risk behaviors. It may be now more selective for the kids with conduct disorder. But I think that if we can re redirect that trajectory to a typical course, we actually could help a number of individuals. I think the statistic I saw is upwards of 40% of adults that seek re rehab for cocaine use have ADHD. So it is a significant problem. And I'm done. Thank you.